hello and welcome to my talk. My name is Franziska Eberle and I am going to present joint work with Nicole Migo and Kevin Schivio. I'm going to talk about how to handle commitment issues in online throughput maximization. Well, I guess all of us have an idea what commitment issues are, so let's start with a problem definition of online throughput maximization. In online throughput maximization, we are given a job set J. I usually depict jobs like shown down here. Each job comes with a processing time. This is the darker part of the interval. And also each job has a deadline and a release date. The important thing here is that the release dates are online. This means only up and release of a job does the scheduler get to know about the job. Furthermore, we are also given a set of machines, M of them, and they are parallel and identical. And the task is to select a subset of jobs such that we can guarantee that all of the jobs complete on time and the, such that the cardinality of this set is maximized. So let's have a look how this example unfolds. Since there's only one job, we can assume that we, let's say, assume, uh, admit this job to the third machine. And once we have done that, um, we work on this job for some time and then the second job, the navy blue job comes. We now might also admit this job, but let's say to the first machine. And then uh, we fast forward a little bit in time to see how the end um, of this instance might look like. As you can see here, um, our scheduler is allowed to preempt jobs. This happens here when the blue job is interrupted in favor of the orange job. And we can also migrate jobs. This means we can preempt the job on one machine and then resume working on this job on another machine. In this particular example, the solution is actually to finish all jobs. That is best possible in this case. Well, this is best possible always. And in this case, it's, it is also possible. So in general, this might not work because in general, incomplete information uh, prevents the scheduler from uh, making optimal decisions. So how do we then measure the quality of an online algorithm? As usual, we use competitive analysis. In fact, we say an algorithm is C competitive if the throughput this algorithm achieves is at least a one over C fraction of the optimal throughput. And optimal throughput is here measured for the offline optimum that is the schedule that knows all jobs and their parameters in advance. So how well can we solve our problem? Unfortunately, in general, we cannot solve it at all, at least not online, um, because by a result, uh, from a result by Barua and others, we know that there is no online algorithm that is C competitive for any C larger or equal than one. That is the reason why we assume that each of our jobs in the system has its length. That is, the interval of the job is at least one plus epsilon times its processing time. Now, given all the input that we need for the problem of online throughput maximization, let's define what are commitment issues in this problem. Well, commitment usually means that the scheduler has to guarantee at some point between the release date of a job and the deadline of a job that this job actually completes on time. From the scheduler point of view, it is best possible, or not best possible, rather it is the most flexible model if this commitment does not have to happen at all and it only happens at the deadline of a job. In this setting, we achieve a commitment, uh, sorry, in this setting, we achieve a competitive ratio of one over epsilon. From the job's point of view, on the other hand, it is best possible if the commitment happens immediately up an arrival of a job that is immediately um, at its release date. In the previous paper, we already showed that there is no um, uh, determin there is no deterministic nor randomized online algorithm that achieves a competitive ratio that only depends on epsilon. So this model, of course, is out of the question since we want to handle commitment models. So what is there in between? Well, one 
particular model is commitment up in admission. That is, once the scheduler starts a job, it has to guarantee that this job also finishes on time. From the job's perspective, this might be a good idea if you're talking about something like um, copying databases, because once we start such a process, we should actually complete it. Otherwise, the data might be, uh, uh, might be destroyed at some point. So in this setting, surprisingly, we achieve the same competitive ratio as in the setting without commitment. And then we also consider a model that somehow interpolates between the first and the third commitment model, namely delta commitment. In this case, the commitment from the scheduler has to happen when the slack has reduced to a delta fraction of the processing time of the job. With this, we can model um, problems where the job owner might move the job to another computing cluster if it cannot finish in this cluster on time. In this setting, our algorithm achieves a competitive ratio of one over epsilon minus delta, which is kind of nice because it also interpolates between the two competitive ratios. Namely, if delta is bounded away from epsilon, let's say it's something like epsilon over two, then this collapses to one over epsilon. On the other hand, when delta tends toward epsilon, then this competitive ratio diverges, which also matches the non-existence of any competitive ratio in the model with commitment up and arrival. So how do we actually achieve these competitive ratios? Well, we developed one algorithm and we can show that this algorithm um, can be implemented and run with different parameters. And depending on the parameter settings, we achieve these three, or we are feasible in these three commitment models. So how does our algorithm look like? It is called the blocking algorithm. And during an execution, it consists mainly of two parts, namely job admission, and then how to schedule the admitted jobs. And um, since the two parts are more or less independent of each other, let's start with how to, admit, how to admit jobs. And on the next slide, I'm going to explain how to then actually schedule the jobs. First and foremost, our algorithm is non-migratory, although we can measure its competitive ratio um, when comparing to an optimal migratory algorithm. Now, this is very important to keep in mind. Our algorithm does not migrate jobs. So how does the algorithm work? Well, first of all, since there's only one job um, there, this first job is admitted to the first machine. Up in admission, we give this job a scheduling interval of length one plus delta times its processing. Delta is either given from the delta commitment model, and then it's exactly this parameter, or we set delta to be epsilon over two in the no commitment model and in the commitment up in admission model. And then, as the name suggests, the job is supposed to only be scheduled in its scheduling interval, and therefore it also has to complete within its scheduling interval. So now that we admitted this job, we already guarantee that we complete the job no matter the commitment model. I'm going to show this to you in a few slides how we can do this. So this means once the next job appears, this is again this navy blue job, we know that we cannot admit this job to the same machine because then we could not finish the first, the blue job. So to formalize this, we introduce the notion of classes and um, each job classifies all jobs that arrive during its scheduling interval in classes, into classes, and it only admits jobs that belong to one of these classes. In this case, it asks if the processing time is smaller by at least a factor of gamma and in this case it would admit the navy blue job but this navy blue job is too long so this blue job is instead admitted to the second machine now let's go through the instance and see what happens next now we have this orange job this orange job is again classified and in this case it belongs to class c2 so this means it is admitted it also gets a scheduling interval and we continue Next, when this yellow job appears, the blue job actually would admit the yellow job because it is small enough, but it arrives during the scheduling interval of the orange job. Now the orange job is responsible. 
So it does not admit the yellow job, but instead the yellow job is now admitted to the third machine. If we continue like this, then we see that now another yellow job comes. And as I promised you before, this indeed belongs to class C1. So the blue job would like to admit it. However, what you can already see here, well, if now a bunch of these jobs appears right after each other, then the yellow job, sorry, then the blue job cannot complete on time anymore. So this means that we have to do something about it because the blue job has to complete on time because we committed to its completion. To do so, we introduce the notion of blocking periods. And this is used for blocking time in which we can actually work on the blue job. And now during the blocking period of this orange job, um, we only admit jobs that belong to strictly larger, or sorry, to strictly higher classes than the orange job. Yeah? The yellow job is C1, the orange job is C2. This means we do not admit the orange job, uh, sorry, the yellow job right now, but instead um, we have to wait until the blocking period ended. At the end of the blocking period, we then have to check if we can still admit the yellow job. This means we have to ask ourselves is if the distance to its deadline is at least one plus delta its processing time. And only in this case, we then admit the yellow job. Here, this is true. So we admit the yellow job and see what happens next. The yellow job now also gets a scheduling interval and a blocking period. And the important thing is now during the scheduling interval of the yellow job, the yellow job is responsible in selecting jobs to admit. In this case, the red job belongs to class C1 again, the yellow job. So it is admitted, it gets a scheduling interval, and it also gets a blocking period. And now as the instance continues, um, we see that now our orange job, class C2 job, appears during the blocking period of the yellow job. Since C2 is strictly larger than C1, strictly higher than C1, this means that the orange job now interrupts the blocking period of the yellow job, gets admitted, and now gets also its blocking, its scheduling interval and afterwards its blocking period. However, if during the blocking period of the orange job, now another orange job appears, then this job is not admitted because they belong to the same. And this is how our algorithm admits jobs. Now that we have decided which jobs admit to admit to which machine, how do we schedule them? This is now straightforward, straightforward because on each machine, we just schedule the jobs in SPT order. In fact, we can even say we only schedule a job if this job is the currently shortest job um, such that the time belongs to its scheduling interval. Yeah, that is why we here have gaps which actually SPT would not produce. However, keep in mind, SPT is easy. So let's just say we schedule our jobs in shortest processing time order. So now that we know how our algorithm works, what can we actually say about its performance? Well, without com commitment, we achieve one over epsilon as competitive ratio. The same holds for commitment up in admission. And as I already explained to you before, in the delta commitment model, the competitive ratio depends on delta as well. Now, how do we prove these results? Um, this is actually pretty cool because we can prove all of these um, theorems with the, basically the same analysis, since the only difference in how to run the algorithm is how we choose our delta. How does the proof then work? It has two parts. The first part is where we show that no matter the commitment model, we complete all, job, all jobs that we admitted. Even in the delta commitment model and even in, the commit, even in the no commitment model, we still complete all jobs. Isn't that cool? And the second part is then to show that we actually admit enough jobs to achieve our competitive ratio that we aim for. So how does the first part look like? Well, we have the beta, this is the length of the blocking the relative length of the blocking period, and we have gamma. This is the parameter with which we decide which jobs are allowed to interrupt other jobs. And we can actually choose these two parameters in this order, in, their, in these orders of magnitude, and still show that this holds. And as we will see, this inequality is pretty helpful. So what do we actually show? We show that each job completes in its own interval. In particular, when we are now interested in asking ourselves whether the blue job 
completes on time, we do not have to consider the red job. Second, our algorithm does not migrate jobs. This means we can simply apply the instance and have a look at only one machine and on, at only the jobs that interrupted the blue job directly. Now for this blue job, we know that the scheduling interval has at least length one plus delta times its processing time. Now you see this also appears up here. And now, as we know from our blocking periods, in a blocking period, we can work on the blue job. And whenever the time does not belong to the scheduling interval of another job, then we can also work on the blue job. This means we have to subtract the scheduling intervals of all the jobs that interrupted the blue job. Let's start with the jobs that are first in their classes. What do we know about them? We know that their size is geometrically decreasing. This means the length of these navy filled intervals can be bounded by this term. Okay, well, with this term, we can't do anything. So we have to subtract it immediately from the length of the scheduling interval of the blue job. Yeah, this is this part here. This is now the part that does not, that is still the scheduling interval of the blue job and does not belong to first jobs in their classes. And now for the second jobs, um, something or third job, something cool happens. Because we know that this orange job is only admitted when the blocking period of the previous orange job already completed. So this means in the red part together, the blue job can be processed for at least this fraction. And this is exactly what appears here. Yeah, so this means since we can choose our parameters in a way such that this holds, that the blue job actually completes on time. Cool, no matter the commitment model, all of our jobs complete on time. Isn't that awesome? Now that we know that our jobs complete on time, let's show that we do admit enough jobs to be competitive. So first of all, we don't know what the optimal solution does. So this means we need to find a good lower bound on the throughput of an optimal solution. First of all, we start with the following observation. Um, our algorithm does not migrate jobs. And second, there is a result by Kalyana Sundaram and Cruz that um, compares the throughput of an optimal non-migratory schedule to that of an optimal but maybe migratory schedule. And they are only a constant apart. So this means instead of comparing ourselves to an, off, to an optimum that we don't, do not know anything about, we take one of our machines, or let's say we take one of the machines with the least throughput, and we compare the throughput on this machine to the throughput on the highest loaded machine of an optimal non-migratory algorithm. If we can compare these two with each other and achieve this bound as shown in the lemma, then I will explain you in a minute, then we can actually show the competitive ratios. So let's do this. Let's see how it works. Let's simplify the instance. The least loaded machine in our example has exactly two jobs. Okay, let's simplify even more and have a look at one particular job, its scheduling interval and its blocking period. These are the length as they were defined uh, up in admission of the navy blue job. And now let's look at jobs that are scheduled by the optimum. And for now, let's make the optimum less powerful. That means the optimum has to schedule jobs immediately up in arrival and without interruption. Yes, that is a very extreme restriction, but it transports the idea of the analysis nicely. So we know that a job admitted during the scheduling interval has to have length at least gamma times pk, because otherwise it would have been admitted by the Navy job. So we can bound uh, the processing time there. Here in the blocking period, we can also bound the processing time, because if it belongs to a strictly higher class, it would be admitted. That is, the processing time also satisfies the lower bound. And if we now combine these two bounds in our super ideal world, we can actually show that our algorithm would be one over delta competitive, because this is the way we chose our parameters gamma and beta. Well, of course, we are not in an ideal world. The optimum is allowed to preempt jobs and schedule them whenever it likes. So this is the reason why we use another factor. And this is also the most technical part of our paper. So in fact, in a not so ideal world, 
um, we can show that our algorithm achieves this competitive ratio, which then translates to epsilon over epsilon minus delta times delta. Well, I claim slightly different um, competitive ratios. So how do they translate to each other? Well, in the first, in the no commitment model and commitment up in admission, we choose delta to be epsilon over two. And then here, this part epsilon over delta is the constant, so we achieve the competitive ratio difference. In the delta commitment model, on the other hand, if delta is super small, let's say less than epsilon over two, we just commit at uh, epsilon over two slack because this satisfies the delta commitment. And then again, the competitive ratio collapses and we get one over epsilon minus delta. On the other hand, if epsilon is larger, equal, greater or equal than delta, then epsilon over delta is roughly one or is again a constant, which means that again, we achieved a competitive ratio of one over epsilon minus delta that I claim here. So this was the analysis. So let's wrap up. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, mm, let's not wrap up. Let's go to the complete instance. And then yes, we can actually translate this also to more jobs. So let's wrap up now. Um, so first of all, I answered the open question whether commitment is harder. No, it is not harder than scheduling without commitment. And I presented the first algorithm on N machines. Of course, there are still some questions open, namely, does randomization maybe help? And is it possible to get a better ratio depending on M? The last question is particularly interesting because in the machine utilization problem, there is a result by Spiegelson and Spiegelson um, that says that their competitive ratio actually decreases with increasing M. So this are, these are two uh, lines of work that we are currently working on. And I am happy to discuss any ideas with you during the poster session of ESA. Looking forward to seeing you there. And thanks for uh, your attention. Bye.